And how are my listeners doing? We're at chapter 2, verse 8 of the book of Esther, and we're finding out what kind of a personality Mordecai actually is. He's a very benevolent, very loving, caring, observant Jewish person. Continuing, So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Hegai, who was in charge of all this, by the way, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of the Hegai, keeper of the women. Notes. Now, evidently, because of her beauty, she was chosen among many others as a possible choice to be the new queen. She was a knockout, a ten and a half, if you will. Verse 9. And the maiden pleased him who was Hegai, and she obtained kindness of him and he speedily gave her things for purification with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens which were meet to be given her uh, notes well of course we're talking about attendance out of the king's house scripture and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women notes she obtained favor from this man, which no doubt was all guided by the Lord. Verse 10. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Notes. Uh, well, in other words, do not. she had not divulged the fact that she was Jewish, and uh, Mordecai instructed her, actually he ordered her not to do any, he ordered her not to uh, tell anyone in order to stop possible prejudices against her because of that. And uh, very, very wise maneuvering, by the way. Verse 11. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Notes. And from this we learn that Mordecai possibly saw something unique and unusual in this young woman, okay? Besides her striking beauty. Verse 12. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished to wit six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. Notes. Well, a year's purification was considered necessary before any maiden could approach the king. So, in other words, they spent quite a bit of time preparing for this little meeting here. Verse 13, middle of the verse. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women under the king's house. Notes. Well, this was quite a deal right here. Any maiden was entitled to demand anything that she liked in the way of dress or ornaments, and it had to be given her so that she might look her best or what she thought was her best. In other words... Whatever they wanted, the king and the higher-ups paid for. Verse 14. In the evening she went, and on the, more, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of Sheashgaz, or Sheashgaz, I should say, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king's she came unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she was called by name. Notes. Well, we have a little ritual right here, which was in, it was incumbent upon each woman to do this. Verse 15. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what he, Guy, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. Notes. Esther would not trust to ostentatious dress or ornaments or diamonds and whatnot, but she would leave it up to Hegai 
as to what she should wear, which evidently portrayed her natural beauty. Okay. Scripture, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them who looked upon her. Notes, uh, she, she, was, uh, she was a cut above the rest, you could say. Very, very beautiful young lady. Verse 16, So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his royal, uh, into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebath in the seventh year of his reign. Notes, okay. Chapter 1, verse 3, coupled with this verse, portrays, or actually it proclaims to us that four years had elapsed between the degradation of Vashti and the enthronement of Esther, okay. Verse 17, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Notes. Thus is uh, this is the providence of God right here, and by His overruling of human folly, Esther was seated upon the throne at the very same time that Satan made a supreme effort to destroy every member of the tribe of Judah in particular, and the Israelites in general, so as to make it impossible for the advent or the advent, <coughs> excuse me, of a promised Savior. In other words, they're trying to destroy Jesus before he can even be born once again, just like with the giants, the ne uh, the Nephilims, or the Anakims, or the children of Anak, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, just another attempt beyond the grave to get to the Messiah before he's even born. After all, it's kind of hard to have a Jesus if you don't have any Jews around. But anyways, he was defeated by the hidden hand of God, and the judgment threatened in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 16 through 18, came to pass. I will hide my face, says the Lord. And that's part of the reason why we don't have a single mention of God in this particular book. But, uh, through, uh, though Israel proved to be faithless to him, he was indeed faithful to her, for he could not deny himself, and uh, though he hid himself, yet was the Lord's care over them as real as it had ever been. Okay, Verse 18, Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, in her honor, and he made a release to the provinces, and gave gifts according to the state of the king. Notes, in other words, uh, he, he gave a relaxation from taxes for a very short period of time, and he gave gifts uh, uh, basically in celebration of his new queen. And who could blame him? Verse 19. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Notes. Well, this is evidently some kind of a Persian ritual to do this, but Mordecai sitting in the king's gate, this signifies place, position, and authority all in the realm of civilized government, okay? Verse 20. Esther had not yet shown her kindred nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Notes. In, in other words, nobody knew she was Jewish, okay? And she had so much respect in Mordec uh, for Mordecai that despite the fact that she is now the very queen of pretty much the entire world, she still heeded the counsel of Mordecai, and believe me, that benefited her very, very well, as you will see in the later chapters. Mordecai basically told her, look, if you don't get your stuff together and do the right things now, you're going to be destroyed along with all the people. Anyways, I'll cover that later. Verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. Notes. 
Uh, these people right here had the position of the highest possible trust, and look at what they're doing with it. But look at verse 22. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. Notes. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus says that a certain man by the name of uh, Pharnabazus, a slave of one of, the con uh, one of the conspirators, betrayed them to Mordecai. Okay, and, But anyways, Esther revealed to the king that Mordecai had relayed to her this information, which would, of course, save the king's life. I mean, he's got people trying to put the old mafia whack job on him whenever he's not looking. So, uh, these events transpiring are going to save the king's life. Verse 23. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Notes. Well, the people who got hung are right there. Big Than and Tiresh, they're gone. And so the king's life was saved because of Mordecai and Esther. Okay, so brownie points right there for both of them. Chapter 3. We're going to have some problems developing right here, okay? After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. Notes. Now, I don't know if this is possible to actually confirm this, but many people believe that Haman was an escaped Amalekite. Okay? Verse 2. And all the king's servants who were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. Notes. Well, the king's servants, government employees, so to speak, they're bowing and showing respect and reverence to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Notes. <clears throat> Now, many people teach that Mordecai was just being arrogant and uh, refusing boldly to bow because he knows that something is wrong with Haman. Well, you have to keep in mind that prostration was, in the mind of Mordecai, an act of worship, and it was not proper to worship anyone except for God. You can read that in Revelation chapter 22, verse 9, and you can find it in, uh, well, anyways, verse 3. Uh, he wasn't going to bow because he was an observant Jew. And, uh, well, you shall have no gods before me, so he's not going to bow. Okay, verse 3. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's commandment? Notes. And here we have it. It seems to me that at least Mordecai had explained to them what his objection was, and to have said that as a Jew, he was precluded from prostrating himself before a man, okay? So, the story that most of you have probably been fed about Mordecai just being arrogant and boldly stepping forward, and uh, somehow knowing that something is wrong with Haman, uh, I don't quite buy that. But anyways, verse 4. Now it came to pass when they spoke daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Notes. Mordecai explained to the palace officials that his uh, not reverencing Haman was not due to discourtesy to Haman or disobedience to the king, but because he was actually a Hebrew, and that is, he worshipped the one and true, only living God. And to bow down was an act of idolatry in his mindset. Refusal to give this homage brought Daniel into the lion's den, and the three princes into the fiery furnace. It may justly, therefore, be assumed from Mordecai's statement that he was a worthy companion of Daniel and the three Hebrew children. In fact, Haman, as stated, was an Amalekite, or I believe so, and as such he was the enemy of God, and Jehovah had sworn to have war with him forever in Exodus chapter 17, verse 16. We'll pick up in chapter 3, verse 5.
of the book of Esther. Thank you, and God bless.